Mighty God, you are awesome in this place. Abba Father, you are worthy of all praise. And to you, our lives we lay. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome. You are awesome in this place. Oh, my dear God. Oh, you are awesome in this place. Hey, I'm a
we give Jesus a better hand than that? We give him a praise. We give him a praise. We give him a praise. He is worthy. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Can greet your neighbors, tell them it's nice to see you in the service. Wakaribisha wambie, ni vizuri kukuona. Hallelujah. Even as we go to God in a praise, in a thanksgiving, we want to tell him he's worthy. Ha! Hallelujah. Weka mikono yako kwa Yesu. Yeah. Hey. 
tunamwimbia masia gelegele tunakuimbia masia gelegele tunakuinua masia gelegele tunamwimbia masia gelegele tunakuinua masia gelegele tunakuimbia masia gelegele tunainamia masia gelegele Tukitazama tunakuimbia masia Tunaruka tunakuimbia masia Mikono yetu twainua kwa kobwana Umetusaidia umetuwezesha masia Tunainua mikono yetu twakupa sifa Tunakuimbia masia 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 Wewe mwana Masia Masia Twakuinua Twakuinua Jesus, we're more than 
Yeah. yeah. 
Lord, we come to cast our crowns today. Yes, yes, Lord, we bow our hearts to you in worship, Lord. Yes, we lift our hands to you, Lord. Yes, we bow to you, Lord. Yes, we bow, we bow, we bow to you, Lord. Lord, this evening we bow to you, Jesus. We cast our crown to you, Lord. We give you all our worship. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. This night evening is all about you. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. It's all about you, Lord of glory. It's all about you, Yahweh. It's all about you, my Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor.
Lion of Harvey. We call you the Lion of the tribe of Judah. We call you the great warrior. You are the glory of God. You are the beautiful King God. Yes, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. We worship. I'm going to read the scripture here when we are still standing up. Thank you so much for turning up to this wonderful, wonderful seminar that we are beginning today. The Bible talks about Barnabas. I'm going to read from verse 19. Please keep standing for the reading of the word of God. Beginning from verse 19, chapter 11. Of Acts beginning from verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Crane went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. That means the grace of God was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 22. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Underline verse 23 when you get time. When they arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. This is New King James. The King James says, when Barnabas arrived there and saw the grace of God, he saw the move of God. He saw with his own eyes what God was doing. He encouraged these people and he told them in King James to follow the Lord with all purpose of heart. What does that mean? They follow the Lord. They should not go ahead of God. They should not be, go behind God. But they follow the move of God. They just follow the move. When it comes to the time of prayer, they pray. When it comes to time of people getting saved, they get saved. When it comes to worship, they worship. They saw the, I mean, Barnabas saw a move of God. That's what we are hearing here, being referred to as the hand of God. They, he saw with his own eyes the move of God. And then he told these people, God is in this place. There is a way that he is moving among you. Can you just follow him? Follow the Holy Ghost. I will say that again. Follow the Holy Ghost. We are used to a service whereby we have programmed ourselves. We come and we know it is two worship songs or three worship songs. And then after that, we sit down and we hear the word. How about when there is a move of God, of when, when it, I mean, as far as pray, as, as far as worship is concerned, are we going to cut that move so that we can hear the word? That's why he told them, put purpose, put commitment in the way you follow the Lord, in the way you follow the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say that again. Put purpose. Not your program. Not your church. You. Not the way you think the service should go. But you put commitment to following the move of the Holy Ghost. This is where we are missing it. Because we come programmed. We even look at our watches. 
how many we are getting late to hear the, the word? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible says when he saw the evidence of the move of God, he told them, guys, God is in this place. Can you just follow him? Give us real worship, please. God is in this place. We want worship first. Guys, worship. 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 Put, put your heart there. Put your heart there now. Oh my 
Let's all be seated in the presence of God. Thank you. Thank you so much for availing yourself to come. I also would like to welcome the many people right now who are worshiping with us through the live media. We bless God for that. Yeah, she can stay a little bit in heaven. She will, she will meet us when she comes back. Thank you. I want us to take this opportunity to bless the name of the Lord right at the beginning of this seminar. I'll say again, when Barnabas saw the evidence of the move of God, remember, when he saw the way God was moving, he told those people, don't take the grace of God in vain. Do this. Put commitment to your pursuing the Lord. I want you to greet two people to the right, to the left, at the back there, and tell them, thank you so much. You are in the spirit. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you tell them, thank you for not taking the grace of God in vain. That's why you are here. Thank you for your commitment. Come on, greet somebody. Tell them, thank you for your commitment. Oh my God. Can you remind your neighbor, the dead will never praise him. Grave will never praise him. Come on, tell your neighbor, I celebrate God for you. That you are able to come. Can you do that? With a nice smile. Not the one. Not the other one. The real one. Come on. Come on. Tell them I celebrate God. That you are able to make it tonight. Right at the beginning of it all. Congratulations. Thank you so much for doing it. We want to receive Isaac. To come and continue please. Just thank you so much, Bishop. I think I'm going to be up here. I might yeah, come. please, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a blessing it is to be back at uh, this pulpit. Um, like I was saying, it is so overwhelming when you minister at the pulpit of your spiritual father. It's such a great honor. We are so humbled, Bishop, and um, everyone that has continued to stand with this vision. My wife today said that she wanted to just stand up and wave, so I'm going to allow her to do that. <laughs> Amen. I don't know whether Bishop can remember, but when I was dating my wife, uh, she was one of those girls that were at the back. She was not at the praise team or any conspicuous place. She was actually very much at the back. Um, she only appear when the children were called to be prayed for. And uh, I remember that when I took her out, I'll not tell you where, because the places that we used to go out for, for meals, Reverend Chege can remember, it was in a place where you could afford several mandazis with a very small amount of money. But I did my best, and I took her you know, to a better place. And after I proposed, you know, um, before she could respond, she said that I should make one commitment, and that is to make sure that I'll never ask her to stand in front of people to say anything. And since I really wanted to get married to her, I promised, I said, I promise that you'll never stand before people. <laughs> I think I've broken that promise so many times. <laughs> So I want to thank God so much for this great opportunity even to share. Um, what I'm sharing with you this week is very dear to me. It is not something that I have learned in school. It is something that I believe, I would say it is who I am. It's the reason why I'm actually standing here today. 
I don't think I can give my testimony enough to tell you that I was not on top of the list during those days when it came to people that you could think that anything good would come out of them. I mean, I was raised by a single mother and I was not highly educated. I did not have any great connections or anything. Even my physical features, um, I don't think at that time would have allowed me to sit among those that would be called elegant people. I, I still remember I would go and look at myself in the mirror and I would shake my head and then I would say, oh my goodness, what can this face do? But you know, as I said a couple of Sundays ago, when I met Bishop Thomas, who was sent by God to this city, and he started ministry, and we were among the first boys that responded. Um, there's an eye that God gave him to see beyond what could be seen by others, such that even at that state, in fact, I remember most of the pastors were accusing him of hanging out with boys and girls. They were even describing this church as a church of the children. But you know, those children, those that were called children then, they are the ones today that are scattered all over the world. And they are doing exploits for the kingdom of God. I think we need to give Jesus a better hand clap. <clears throat> I know some of you, when you saw me at first, after 10 years, uh, you discovered that um, I've changed my color. That's another story for another day. But the grace of God is able to take even what the enemy plans in your life and transform it and make it good. Praise the Lord. Yeah, so when I'm in America, I blend very well. Even with those racists. The reason why when I was asked by my spiritual father to come and share with us this week, the reason why I felt in my spirit that God wanted us to discuss and just um, look against things that we already know on the topic of spiritual heritage, it is because I believe it is crucial for us to have this discussion. It is very important for us if we care about the move of God and if we care about legacy, if we care about what God is doing now and what God is doing in the future, for us to seriously engage with this important thought, kingdom thought, about spiritual heritage. In my study of the Bible, I came across uh, what I would describe as the most disturbing scripture in the Bible. And there are so many scary scriptures in the Bible, but this particular one is so disturbing and I believe that's why we should have the discussion about spiritual heritage. And this disturbing scripture is what probably we are going to begin with from the book of Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. You know the book of Judges is a very interesting one. And there are several phrases that are repeated in this book where it says there was no king in Israel and because of that everyone did according to what they saw right in their eyes. When there is no spiritual leadership, the Bible says where there is no vision, people perish. And another translation says where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. There is no direction. The book of Judges, the Bible says in chapter 2, and probably we could begin from verse 7. My interest is in verse 10. The Bible says in Judges 2 and verse 7, the people worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime. And during the lifetime, 
the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua, they had seen all the Lord's great works that he had done for Israel. In verse 8, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. In verse 9 says, they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Geash. Verse 10 says, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. <coughs> After them, another generation rose up which did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. If you would ask me the saddest or the most disturbing scripture in the Bible, it is Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Because it says, and a new generation arose which did not know the Lord and neither did they know the works of the Lord. Verse 7 tells us during the times of Joshua, the Bible says everybody worshipped the Lord. And Joshua had also raised the elders who had received the spiritual DNA. And the Bible says throughout the time of Joshua and throughout the time of the elders that Joshua mentored, Israel worshipped the Lord. There was power in Israel. No enemy would beat Israel during the times of Joshua. Why? Because the connection of Israel and God was intact. There was no problem when it came to the power of God moving, the grace of God, the victory of God. Nobody dared to attack Israel. And if they did, they were whipped properly. Why? Because God was at work in Israel. But the Bible says during the time of Joshua and the elders, everything was okay. Until the Bible says that generation was gathered to their ancestors. That means they passed on. Our God is the generational God. That's why the Bible introduces him as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, he's the generational God. What God does at one time is not meant to come to an end at that particular time. What God does is generational. It's supposed to be passed on from one generation to the next. And those of you that know the principles of impartation generationally, you know by the time something passes on from one generation to the next, if it successively passes on, then there's a doubling and there's a tripling of the anointing. In other words, according to, you know, to the design of God, the next generation should be more powerful, should be more skilled, should be sharper, should flow in the gifts of the Holy Ghost more than the previous generation. But it appears there was a disconnect generationally in the scripture that we have just looked at. And that's why the Bible tells us, although it was wonderful during the times of Joshua, and the elders, you come to verse 10, and the Bible says, there arose another generation that did not know the Lord. How sad. We are talking about Israel. And the Bible says, they did not know the Lord, nor the works of the Lord. That's why it is important for us to discuss about what I'm calling spiritual heritage. Because without the spiritual heritage passing on from one generation to another, we are at the risk of losing the next generation. That's why the craziness that we have in our generation, we should make sure that we find every way to make sure it goes on and touches the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and that that can only happen if we know how to make sure the spiritual heritage is passed on. You know, they did some statistics. And they say this, that without intentional engagement with the next generation, 
there is a likelihood that the good that is done in one generation will be done halfway, 50% in the next generation. By default, anything that is done in a good way in one generation, if there is no intentional engagement with the next generation, the next generation will do that good only halfway, 50%. Yet the same statistics also say the bad and the evil that is done in one generation, if there is no active engagement, no, if there is no active disengagement of that evil from one generation to another, the next generation is going to do it twice. They're going to do it twice. In other words, there is an enemy out there who wants to make sure that the evil that is, is done in one generation is done twice in the next generation, while the good is done in one generation is going to be done only halfway, 50% in the next generation. That is why you and I need to arise, take our position, and make sure we change that statistics. And make sure that instead of the evil being done twice, it is the good that is going to be done twice. It is possible that we raise a generation that is more powerful, that is more anointed, that is more successful in every sphere of life, more than we are today. The only reason why God would allow me to stand here as the son of this ministry it is to prove that generational inheritance can be effective. Those of you that know my history, you know I was not, I mean, there's no way. It was impossible for me to stand behind a pulpit like this. But if there was something in the generation of my spiritual father that was powerful and active and that was successfully transferred to me and it is working in a greater measure, then it is my responsibility to make sure that spiritual heritage passes on to the next generation. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah Chapter 51, we're going to see how much we're going to be able to cover tonight. We got several days and I am believing God that by his grace, we will look at some things that are very important. Isaiah chapter 51, all the scriptures that I'm going to read are not new to you. This is a house that is taught the word of God. I don't think there's any scripture that I can go to which you have not heard from before. I'm only coming to repeat and remind and confirm. Isaiah chapter 51. Bible says verse 1 and 2. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut. And to the quarry from which you were hewn. Verse 2 says, look to Abraham, your father. And to Sarah, who gave birth to you. Those are very powerful scriptures if we meditate upon. Isaiah writes and says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. You who seek to see the work of God going on. You that seek the kingdom of God. You pursue righteousness. You want to see God at work. He says, listen to me. Pay attention. You who seek the Lord. Nobody seeks the Lord if you do not want to see him at work. Let me see by show of hand how many of you are seekers of the Lord. You are seeking the Lord because you want to see his hand. You want to see his power at work. So you are the ones that Isaiah is talking to you. He says, you who seek after righteousness. You who pursue righteousness. You who seek after the Lord. He says, I'm going to show you 
how you can pursue the Lord and be successful. He says, look. That word look in the Hebrew language actually means turn and pay attention to. Not just opening your eyes and seeing something. But intentionally turning and paying attention to something. We are living in very prophetic times where we should not take things for granted. We should do things intentionally and purposefully. I need to tell you this, that most of the things in the kingdom of God do not happen by default. They don't just happen by default. You know, there are some of us who expect some things to happen by default. That means they just happen automatically. Things in the kingdom of God happen intentionally. Somebody needs to know what they are doing and what they want to get in their lives. There were so many people that touched Jesus on the road to his missions. Yet, no power, no virtue went out until a woman came and did not just touch like others, but she came intentionally because she wanted to get something out of him. It was not just a touch for coincidence. It was not by default. She had to press herself through and came intentionally. And God is looking for intentional people. People who show up through that door with an intention. They have a focus. They have a target. They don't waste time. They know what they want. Have you realized that when you want, I mean when you know what you want, you don't waste time on some things that distract you? People that know what they want, they go straight to their target. And he says, turn and pay attention to. And he says two things there that are very important. He says, look to the rock from which you were cut. And look to the quarry from which you were hewn. Two things there. Look to the rock from which you were cut. And look to the quarry from where you are hewn. It is talking about two things there. The first thing is talking about the rock of Israel. The rock of Israel is Jehovah God. Every human being was cut from this rock. The book of Genesis tells us God said let us Make man in our own image, in our own likeness. In other words, when you look at any human being, you are looking at a stone that was cut from the rock. We bear the image of God and the likeness of God. And he says, for you to succeed, you need to turn intentionally and reconnect to your rock. And make sure that you have the resemblance of your rock. That's why we are called the children of God. In the book of Acts, they did not struggle to identify those that followed Christ. The Bible says when they looked at them, there were things that were happening and they recognized that they had been with Christ. That's why... There was no denomination or name in the book of Acts. You don't hear all the churches that are registered today. These days we have all kinds of names. I know you got a few, but in America we got more. We got all kinds of names of ministries coming up. I wouldn't be surprised to even see a church called the Church of Bristol in Barnacles. Or anything like that. In the book of Acts, no names, no denomination or names, no labels. You know how they used to address them? They were described as the people of the way. The people of the way. You could not have made a mistake. Why? They resembled the rock from where they were cut. So he's talking about looking and reconnecting with God. 
That's why I believe with all my heart, even for those of us that have been in the ministry for long and have known Jesus for long, God is calling us to reconnect to our rock once more in passionate prayer, in fasting, in reading the word of God, in seeking God early in the morning, in, in, in making sure that we create time. Why? We are looking to the rock from where we were cut. There's something that happens uh, when you look to the rock from where you were cut. You begin to look into the mirror. You begin to resemble that rock. You begin to receive something from the rock. He said, those that pursue righteousness and seek the Lord, turn intentionally and pay attention, reconnect to the rock. Something happens when you reconnect to the rock. And then number two, it says, look to the quarry from where you are hewn. Look to the quarry from where you are hewn. And if you connect that with the next verse, you will understand what God is saying. God is saying, look to me, I am the rock from where you are cut. But then verse 2 says, look to Abraham and to Sarah. What? Look to Abraham. Look to Sarah. Turn and reconnect. That's the quarry. The rock is only one. But there are many quarries. There are many quarries. The rock is only one. And he says, for you, Israel, your quarry is Abraham. And your quarry is Sarah. Who gave birth to you. They used to tell me, and I'm sure we have builders in our midst. They used to tell us, at least when I used to be here, that builders, when they are building, it is possible for them to look at a rock or a stone, and they can tell you from which quarry it comes from. They will tell you this stone comes from that particular quarry. Why? Because they knew if it has some reddish or whatever, it comes from, I cannot remember the names of the quarries. I mean, builders are able to look at a stone and they can tell you this one was hewn from a particular quarry. Because every stone is supposed to resemble its quarry. Spiritual heritage is very important because God takes it seriously. It is intentional. I will show you this week that it is God who designed you to be hewn from a particular quarry. Depending on the calling of God upon your life, depending on the plan that God has for you, depending on your destiny, he placed you in a particular quarry and caused you to be hewn out of the quarry. Let me share with you what I have learned about the composition of spiritual heritage. We're going to take several things according to the time that we have. Composition of spiritual heritage. When we talk about spiritual heritage, what are we talking about? When we talk about the rock, when we talk about the quarry, what are we talking about? If we are stones that have been cut from the rock, and if we are stones that have been hewn from the quarry, what are we talking about? I believe that spiritual heritage is composed of at least five things. At least five things. There could be more, but I have learned at least five things that if you can only know how to activate them in your life, you are actually activating spiritual heritage. I told you yesterday, everything that you will ever need is locked up in your spiritual heritage. Everything.
everything. You know, during those days, they used to tell us that we are supposed to divide between spiritual things and secular. Have you heard that? Such as there are people that say, oh, that's spiritual and that's what? Secular. There is nothing like that in the Bible. Nothing. Everything is spiritual. Everything. Everything has to do with your spiritual health. It's not just prayer. It's not that what we call the spiritual things. That's why the reason why the Jews are successful wherever they go. Check it out. Even those who are called Orthodox Jews who have not yet accepted Christ as their Messiah. The reason why Jews are prosperous everywhere they go, especially in business and investment, it is because they grow up being taught you don't divide up the issues of life and label some spiritual and others secular. They live a lifestyle in Hebrew that is called avoda. Avoda to a Jew is what they describe as a seamless life. A life that has no boundaries. A life that does not have lines of division. A seamless life. And avoda to a Jew is a seamless life of worship, service, and business. There is no division between those three. Worship, service, and business. That's why to every Jew, before they open up their business, they have to dedicate their business to God. Why? Because business without service and without worship is not complete. We are the only ones that the enemy came and deceived us that some things are spiritual and some things are secular. Never fall into that trap of dividing up your life. When you show up at that office, when you show up at your business place, you are still in worship. You are still in service to God. You are still in avoda. There, is, there are no divisions. And the same spiritual tools that you use when you are worshiping God are the same that you are going to need in your place of work and in your business. It is called avoda. Composition of spiritual heritage. Let's look at the first one. The first composition of spiritual heritage. Spiritual heritage begins when we get born again. When we give our lives to Jesus, there is something we receive which is the beginning point of spiritual heritage. When you and I gave our lives to Jesus, that is where spiritual heritage began. We received what the Greeks call the Zoe life. The Zoe life. The life of God. The divine life of God that we receive at salvation. That's the beginning of our spiritual heritage. This is a familiar portion of scripture. But let's just read Ezekiel chapter 16. And, <coughs> and look at the Zoe life that we receive at salvation. That is the beginning of our spiritual heritage. Ezekiel chapter 16. And beginning from verse 4. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning from verse 4. Thank you. As for your birth, Okay, we can begin from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, 
confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. You are to say, this is what the Lord God says to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hethite. Verse 4, as for your birth, your umbilical cord wasn't cut on the day you were born. And you weren't washed clean with water. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped up in clothes. Verse 5, no one cared enough about you to do even one of these things out of compassion for you. But you were thrown out into the open field because you were despised on the day you were born. Verse 6, look at what God did at salvation. The Bible says in verse 6, but I passed by you and saw you struggling in your blood. And I said to you, while you lay in your blood, live. Yes, I say to you, as you lay in your blood, live. At the moment of salvation, this is what happens. God says, tell Israel where you were born and how you were born. You were cast out. There was no hope for you. And that is true for every one of us. Before we come to Christ, we have no hope. We have no future. We have no beauty. Bible says we are away from the covenant. Away from God. Nothing desirable in us. God says when you were born, first of all, every deformity and every contamination was part of your life. He says that even the umbilical cord was not even cut. Have you heard people talk about, I mean, generational curses? Things that tie us to those ancestors? God says, when I came, I discovered that your umbilical cord was not even cut. You are still connected to everything that was flowing from the previous generation. He says that even when you were born and when they got you out, you were not even rubbed with salt. In other words, the wound was still fresh. And God says, no one had compassion on you. No one even came to wrap you up with the clothes at least so that you may become warm. And God said, by the time I came, they had thrown you out in the open field. How many of you can identify with that before you came to Christ? That is how we were. It's a miracle that you and I are sitting here looking all good, having the glory of God, being able to raise up our hands to worship God. Our neighbors admire us. That's not the way we were before we came to Christ. And some of us, even when we came to Christ, we still had things to deal with. Thank God that we came to a church, to a place with an anointing of spiritual warfare. They taught us how to address things in the spiritual realm. We were able to put the devil where he belonged. They taught us how to break the national curses. And God says that when I came and looked at you, you are struggling in your blood. You are struggling in your blood. But at the moment of salvation, God says, when I came and saw you struggling in your blood, I spoke into your struggling. I spoke into your condition. I spoke into your life. And God says, I said, live. He spoke life. He spoke the Zoe life, the supernatural life into the circumstance. And he said, I say to you, live. And God says, I repeat, I say to you, live. God spoke life. That is the beginning of spiritual heritage. 
you have something in your life that you got from salvation at your place of salvation. I do not know where you gave your life to Christ. Uh, I don't know whether it was at the marketplace, in a crusade, or someone witnessed to you. But the minute you said, I received Jesus as my personal Savior, that is when God came over you and saw that your umbilical cord was still connected to your generation. And he saw you struggling. He saw you cast out there. And by the simple confession and inviting Jesus in your life, he spoke the Zoe life into you. That is why any person that is genuinely born again, they can go through any kind of hell, but they are going to come through to the other side because there is a life that was declared in their lives. God came and found them struggling and he said, leave! And even today, the reason why you are still going on, although you've gone through a lot, it is because of that simple declaration that was made from the heavens. In your struggling, in your blood, God said, leave! And because of that, leave! That's why we are able to leave. In the Hebrew, that word leave it's the word higher. God declared and he said, higher. You know what higher means? Higher means make it. God said, make it. God spoke into a struggling condition at salvation and he said, make it in life. That is why my brother and my sister, there is no other route. You got to make it or make it. Because it's a declaration from a heaven that came when you are struggling in your blood. That is your spiritual heritage. God said, make it. Higher also means show up. It means come forth. That means when you receive Jesus Christ, you cannot be hidden anymore. You got to show up. You got to come forth. It is one word of saying leave. He said higher. And even today, the reason why you are the way you are today, it is because that word is still active in your life. That life is still active in your life. And I told you yesterday what the Philistines want to do is to make sure they come and stop that one. So that you may go back to struggling. So that your umbilical cord may be reconnected back to where it had been before. And so that you may start struggling in your blood. That is why when you begin to see signs of struggle in your life, you need to stand up and say, I know this is not my spiritual heritage. I know this is not what I received. I know when I was struggling in my blood, somebody by the name Jesus Christ passed by and he looked me in the eye when I was struggling in my blood and he said, higher, higher, higher. He said, leave. He said, make it in life. There is no other way we have to make it. We have to make it. There can be battles. There may be struggles. But higher has been declared over us. That's why Jesus said, the enemy, the thief comes. Not for any other purpose, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, I came to declare higher. I came that they may have life. What kind of life? Not the struggling one. Not life that is limited. Not life that barely gets you out of your struggle but leaves you outside without clothes around you. God said they had thrown you out. But one declaration of higher. You became beautiful and you started kicking again. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have life in abundance. 
that means it is your responsibility and my responsibility to make sure everything that Christ paid for we enjoy to the fullest if you are here and you are struggling in the in, you know in some areas and you are having life but not life to the fullest you need to stand up and say i'm going to reactivate my spiritual heritage i received my spiritual heritage at my place of salvation where god declared life he said come forth he said show up and is the joy kind of life that is the first component of spiritual heritage let us take the second one second component of spiritual heritage how many of you can agree with me that on that one you got it how many of you got the first component how many of you got the zoe life how many of you will make sure that that life is going to flow and be channeled in everything that you do? And if you see anything that is short of that, you say that is not what God declared. God saw me struggling and he said higher. And he said life, live. The second component is a spiritual family. Spiritual family. Spiritual family. You see, if it was very easy for us to make it in life after salvation, God would have saved us and declared, live and then leave us alone. But you see what the Bible says in the book of Psalm 68? <coughs> Psalm 68 and verse 6. One of the things that God does is that the Bible says that he sets the lonely in families. That's what the Bible says there in Psalm 68 and verse 6. So when God comes and saves you and saves me, he doesn't just leave us like that just because we have the joy of life. Because even that time you are lonely. The Bible says he takes the lonely and puts them in families. Spiritual family is the second component of your spiritual heritage. That's why it says look to the quarry from where you were hewn and it says Look to Abraham and Sarah. That's family. He's talking about family. And in the family, you are going to find what is called spiritual DNA. God takes the lonely and puts them in families. And I need to say a few things here. The first thing is this. When it comes to family... God does not give you the responsibility of throwing in an application to which family you want to be put in. I'm saying this because until we get this, we are going to struggle trying to find things outside family. One of the most disturbing things that is going on is that there are so many sons who are growing up in families, but they are not giving God enough time to give them spiritual heritage. After some time, they are jerking out of their families and looking for other people to call father and mother. I'm a son in the house, so I'm going to be free and tell you this, especially in Africa, so many people have the habit of calling others daddy. Dad, dad. Especially if you are kind to them and if you come with a loaf of bread in the evening, you become a dad automatically. If you show, you know, if you show some care a little bit, they call you mom. It's because there is a yearning for that identity. But in the real sense, not every man who is wearing a trouser who qualifies to be called your dad. 
Not every mother who passes by because they look fluffy and cute. Who oh, is supposed to be called your mother? There has to be something in common. There has to be a DNA. When it comes to families, we don't throw in an application. That's why in Psalm 68, where we've just quoted, it says God takes you and puts you. It is him who looks at you and knows what he wants to do with your life and he finds a family for you. And he says this is where you belong. The DNA that is in this family, the grace and the anointing in this family is what you need for you to become who I have called you to become. That is why every time you wish you were in another spiritual family, you are wasting time and delaying your destiny. And I guarantee you there is nowhere in scripture where we are promised that families will be perfect. Not even in, in, in places where prophecy and spiritual gifts are exercised. I always tell people in our church in Portland, Oregon, I always tell them, for those of you who are looking for a perfect church, we were perfect until you came. Your coming is what introduced imperfection. We were all right until you came. But I want to tell you there is something powerful that happens in a spiritual family. Something that you can never get outside the family. God did not just save you and give you Zoe life and declared life to you and left you. The Bible says he took you because you were lonely. He takes the lonely and then put you in the family of Abraham and Sarah. And each family has its own traits. How many of you agree with me that families are not the same? Right? Yeah. Families are not the same. Every family has its own strengths. Every family has its own uniqueness. And when God places you in a spiritual family, you better quickly begin to learn what are the traits in the DNA of your family. What is the strength? If you travel from here, and come to our church in Portland, Oregon, or go to any church or fellowship where a son of this house or a daughter of this house is ministering. There are things we'll do there you may think you are in Kiambu. Copyright. Sometimes I listen to the messages of my spiritual father. I preach them word to word. I need to confess my sins. You know why? The Englishman said, you don't need to reinvent, I mean, re, you know, reinvent a wheel. Right? If the person who did, a, you know, the job of inventing the wheel did a great job, why should you struggle trying to come up with a rectangular wheel. They tell us in America, don't fix it if it's not broken. So some of us are trying to come up with some things just to show others like we are really busy trying to fix something that is not broken. Instead of grabbing what is working, and working with it and making sure that you produce some results. Why sons and daughters, they learn what is the uniqueness of their family? I don't have time to show you that even in the way that the tabernacle in the wilderness was organized. God is the God who is so organized Every tribe was positioned 
according to their strength and according to their unique grace. And every tribe had its own uniqueness. That's why if there is something I love to teach, I love to teach about spiritual tribe. You got to know about your spiritual tribe. Because every tribe had its own uniqueness. When it came to the things of the temple, not every tribe could just go there and handle the things in the tabernacle. Only the tribe of Levi. And each one of those tribes, if you read, they had their own role and their own uniqueness. Some of the tribes, their work was to produce money like Zebulun. And I think that's where most of the Kikuyus belong. And you don't need to struggle to function if you only understand your spiritual family. You know, there are things when you're in the spiritual family, when you begin to do them, it's going to be like fish that is put in the water. It's going to be so difficult for you to take the fish and give it an assignment of climbing the tree. And say, I prophesy to you, you're going to climb the tree. <laughs> you give that assignment to a cat. Fish, put it in water. There are things as long as you are in the spiritual family. That's why the Bible has a language. It talks about things like the company of the prophets. Someone like Saul, the Bible says when he joined the company of the prophet, although he was never a prophet and he didn't even look like one, he was so tall. Prophets those days were short. But because he joined the company of the prophets, the Bible says he also did what? He prophesied. Why? He came into the family DNA. Until the Bible says they asked, is Saul also among the prophets? Now the foolish people who do not know that it is something with the family and that some things can only function when you are part of the family, they think that they are uniquely graced and anointed. And so they come out of the family and begin to do some stuff outside there and they realize it's not working. It's not working because you are no longer part of the family. It is that inheritance where the Bible says, and the son who walks out of home, the inheritance will find its way back home. The reason why I'm able to preach like I'm preaching is because I'm still part of the family. Don't make a mistake. I'm not preaching because I'm so anointed and I went to school and I went to America. I'm able to do this because I'm using the family grace. There are things you never struggle to do because God put you in a family and your spiritual heritage is right there. And you have the DNA of the family. You know why people, most people don't like, yeah, I need to quit. You know the reason why most people don't like the family? It is because it is the family, which is your quarry, that most of the chiseling work is done. You know what the Bible says in First Kings? Let's just quit by looking at 1 Kings chapter 6. Look at how God wants to use the stones from the quarry. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 7. The temple's construction used finished stones. Everybody say finished stones. 
God does not want to use stones that are unfinished. The temple's construction used finished stones which were cut at the quarry. Another translation says chiseled at the quarry. No hammer, I mean so that no hammer, no chisel or any iron tool was hard in the temple while it was being built. Let me help somebody here as we pray tonight. When God is building, he does not want the kind of noise that we hear in most of the churches. Where a stone was placed in a place, but because it was unfinished, we have to use the chisel and the hammer while the building is going on. Look at the temple. Bible says when the temple was being built, they used finished stones that had been chiseled where? At the quarry. Let the hammer, let the chisel, let the shipping, let the discipline be done at the quarry. By the time you are picked up to be fitted in God's building, no noise should be made. No tool should be used because you have given your family at the quarry the grace and the permission to work on you. Let me tell you why some stones have not been picked up yet. They have not been chiseled enough. How many of you know that some of the values that we have today, we were actually, I mean, they were input in us in the family setting? Because in the family, that's where your mother can tell you, you don't cook like that, right? Your mother should not wait until you are married and you are cooking for your husband because it's going to be too late. By the time you go to your husband, you get married, you are supposed to be a stone that is finished in the kitchen. The the chiseling is supposed to be done at the quarry where you are told this is not how. You don't add too much water to the skooma week until it becomes like a swimming pool. How many of you know that it is in the family where we, we can be corrected? We can be chiseled. The problem is some stones, they are too proud to be chiseled. So when somebody tells you you need to change this and this, you begin to have an attitude. God put you in a spiritual family and so that you may be worked on in the quarry by the time you are put on the building you are good to go we're going to go on with the other components tomorrow but how many of you are glad that we were picked up by God when we were thrown out there that is where our spiritual heritage began. We have the life of God in us. We have the joy of God in us. We are unstoppable. And not only that, God chose what spiritual family we needed to be put in. Do not be like one girl in America who the parents thought that they would teach her better because she was eating too much pizza and junk food. And so, the parents said, we are vegetarians. And she recorded a video complaining. And she said, this is not working out. Just a little girl. This is not working out. Now my parents have turned into, I don't know what they are calling vegetarians. That means there is no pizza, there is no sausage. And then she says, I need some new parents. You know, some people, they are saying they need new parents just because they would not eat vegetarian. If God in his own wisdom put you in a family of spiritual vegetarians, you better comply. That's where your destiny is. That's where your praise is. That's where your anointing is. That's where everything that you need is.
Why don't you stand on your feet and just thank God right now? Just take one minute and thank God as my, you know, as my spiritual father comes. Just begin to thank God Come for on. your spiritual heritage. Raise up your hands, please. Praise him very quickly. We want to receive the tithes and the offerings. But first of all, raise up your hand. Bless the name of the Lord. That you are born again. You are alive. You are alive. You are alive. You are living. You are living. You are living. You are living. Come on, raise up your hand. And you have a family. You have a family. Come on, raise up your hand. Bless the name of the Lord. Shandarabaraka <laughs> Shandara baganda la ba 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 la ba 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 Father, we thank you for life. We thank you that in us is Zoe, the God kind of life. We thank you that the umbilical cord that was there, that connected us with our ancestors, the curses, that one was cut off. We are new creation in Christ Jesus. We have life. We have life. And we bless you for the spiritual family. We thank you for the family of Word of Faith Church. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We thank you for our DNA. We bless you, my God. I want to bless you, Lord, that we are carnivores. We eat the Word. We eat the meat of the Word. We bless you today. Bless you, Lord. Thank you. We just want to worship you with our tithes and offerings and just bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Remember to come very early tomorrow. Give us praise here. Give us praise. Hallelujah. Come with us someone tomorrow.